I want to start by uh, having you imagine something for me, okay? Imagine that you are standing on a beach in the Bahamas. It's a nice sunny day. It's a nice beach. That's a good image, right? Um, it's 1492. And from the east, three rickety wooden boats sort of lurch their way across the horizon, and out of it comes Christopher Columbus. And he comes up to the shoreline, and you, being from this audience, walk up to him and say, Sir, you today are starting a chain of events that in 500 years, for good and more than often ill, will lead to a billion people living on two continents you haven't seen and won't see in some of the most prosperous, powerful nations on Earth. Well, his initial reaction, I'm pretty sure, would be to be confused because he thought he was in Indonesia. But after that, he would probably think that you're wrong. He would say, what are you talking about, a billion people? That's more than there are on the entire planet. And in any case, it was a huge effort for me to get here. I had to get the crown to give me three ships. I had to find a crew that didn't want to uh, uh, worry about falling off the edge of the earth just to get them out here. It was a massive enterprise. How are people going to come here? Why are they going to come here? Well, he would have been wrong if he took that position, of course, because there are a billion people in the Americas, and there are powerful nations there, and uh, they came for a variety of reasons. They came for wealth, they came for political and religious freedom, and they came for personal glory, which is sort of the reasons why people do anything anyway. And what made it possible was an ongoing exploration of the Americas, fueled by steady improvements in technology that made it possible. But that voyage was the thing that really got it taking off. So my goal here is to suggest that maybe we are at a similar inflection point, a moment where we might be opening up a new world that will change the lives of our descendants in a way that is comparable to the way the lives of the descendants of Columbus have been changed. Now, that sounds pretty grandiose, I know. So um, you're probably wondering where this new world is and what this new world is, and I bet you have visions in your mind, so it's probably just good if I just show you. All right, it's not much, but there's a lot of promise there. Let me, uh, let me explain why. So this is an example of something called a small body or a planetesimal. And by small, I do mean small. I mean objects like the one in, in this particular image that would easily fit on this stage, up to things that might be as much as 100 kilometers across. Not very big, not planets. Oh, but they're old. They are the primordial remnants of the formation of our solar system. As a scientist, I am fascinated by these objects because they are the building blocks of the planets. And they tell us about that time before there were planets. So from a scientist's perspective, these are amazing things. But also, as it turns out, the new world. So for a little bit of context here, you know planetesimals by different names. There are two broad classes of them, one the asteroids, other comets. And really, the differences between them are based on the amount of different compounds inside them. For instance, asteroids have more minerals and metals than organic material and water, whereas comets have lots of water and organic material and progressively less minerals and metals. As building blocks, the asteroids are what we make terrestrial planets out of, like Earth, and comets are what we made the cores of the giant planets out of, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Now, you might be surprised to find this out, but we have only known about these objects for about 200 years. And almost everything that we do know about them, we have learned in the last few decades. Now, I would like to tell you that we learned all of this because of some high-minded desire to learn about our origins and because my scientific arguments were so compelling that everybody invested their resources in studying these objects, but the real answer is fear. 
We learned about these objects because we were afraid of them. In the 1970s, Walter and Luis Alvarez made the now famous discovery that the non-avian dinosaurs appeared to go extinct, almost coincident with a large asteroid impact 65 million years ago. Now, there are a few things that focus the mind quite like the prospect of sudden, fiery death from above. And so, we instituted a global effort to find every object in our solar system that was more than 100 meters across and figure out whether or not it was going to hit the Earth in the future. This was a huge enterprise. It required dozens of telescopes, many countries working together. And it's been enormously successful in two ways. The first is that we have found a huge number of these objects. At current count, we have identified something on the order of half a million planetesimals at orbits ranging all the way out to the region beyond Pluto. Now, I'm going to focus my talk, the rest of this talk, on a particular subgroup of that half million, a group of objects that I, well, we call near-Earth objects, or NEOs. Now, NEOs have a common characteristic. That common characteristic is, is that at some point in their journey around the sun, they will approach or cross Earth's orbit. Now, from the perspective of threat, that makes them sound like the ones we care most about, which is true. So we dedicate a lot of our effort to looking at NEOs, trying to identify which one of them might be potentially hazardous to us. And just like with everything else, we've been very successful at studying the NEO. Um, since 2000, we've discovered almost 15,000 of these objects. And I, I sort of put in perspective here, the, the movie Armageddon was released just as it expanded up. So maybe the movie industry also helped fuel this investigation, uh, or not. But 15,000 objects that have an orbit that approach or cross ours. Now, that's potentially scary, except that we have mapped all of these orbits for every one of these objects, and not one of them is likely to hit us. Best failure ever. We are not going to be threatened by any of these objects. Now, the caution in this, and also the good news, is that we've only just started this process. We estimate that there may be as many as 100,000 to a million more objects in these orbits with diameters below 100 meters that we have yet to see. So maybe one of those might threaten us in the future, but right now the numbers look good in our favor. Now the side effect of this is the NEOs are on our cosmic porch. Their orbits come close to Earth. They don't tend to go too far from the sun. Uh, they are rich in water, minerals, metals, other things, and they're primordial, so we can learn more about our origins by looking at them. We can see them more easily, and more importantly, if we need to, we can get to them. So they are very important, scientifically and potentially economically. But there is a problem. And that problem is, even with our biggest telescopes, they still look like that little dot. They're small. They're too small to be resolved. So all we can see is a point of light. And we can learn some things from that point of light. Uh, we can uh, look at the light that's reflected off of it, and that tells us something about the nature of these objects. But to turn them into real worlds, that we can't do. Nevertheless, it's what we've got. And I like to call this kind of exploration spherical cow exploration. It's all cow. It's missing a few details, like legs. But it's an average. By looking at the average characteristics of an object, we can learn something about it. Uh, how its brightness changes with time tells us a little bit about its rotation. Its total brightness tells us a little bit about its size. Breaking it out into colors tells us a little bit about its composition. And even from that limited perspective, 
when we started looking at these objects, we began to realize that an asteroid is not an asteroid, is not an asteroid. A comet is not a comet, is not a comet. In fact, within these groups, there's phenomenal diversity. I'll show you a little bit about what I mean. Apologize for the complexity of this, but there are three broad groups to asteroids. We have our stony asteroids, which are mineral rich, our metal asteroids, metal rich, and we have what's called chondrites, which are water and organic material rich. And within each of these broad groups, we have these subgroups where there are different mixtures of minerals, metals, and chondrites. And uh, each of these groups subdivides further. And then we have a whole group of other potential types that we've identified that don't fit in any of those groups. And the more objects we observe, the more asteroid classes we seem to get. And the same is true for comets. Now, comets are traditionally divided based on their orbits, long period, short period, and intermediate or Halley-type orbits. Uh, those orbits tell us about where they come from. They tell us about how much evolve, evolution they've undergone. But even within those groups, we have little compositional subgroups. And those compositional subgroups are based on the amount of water relative to the amount of organics, relative to the amount of certain volatiles like ammonia and cyanide. And those groups are distributed somewhat differently in the different classes, but we're still trying to understand exactly how they're organized overall. So we can learn something from just a point. However, what we don't learn from that are the rich details that make them worlds. We can't tell you from a point source what its shape is. We can't really tell you its size. We don't know the axis on which it rotates. We don't know its density. We don't know if it's uniform on its interior. We don't know if it's uniform on its surface. We don't know what its surface is like. If we're just going to go there based on a point source, we have to make a lot of guesses about the environment that we're going to get into. And that brings me to the next part of this exploration, which I call the one-off part of exploration. And this is the traditional NASA model. Since the mid-1980s, we have been launching robotic spacecraft to small bodies. We've been to about 20 of them now, so uh, less than 1% of all the objects we know of that are near-Earth objects. Uh, these spacecraft are really marvels. They are highly capable. They have enormous complexity. Um, and they're highly customized to the environment that they're going to. They're launched uniquely for one target that we identified as being in particularly important to the scientific community, and that's it. And they're very risk intolerant. They need to work. They're expensive. Some of these are a billion dollars. So uh, they've made great strides. They have learned an enormous amount about small bodies. Here's an example of one. Uh, this is Comet 67P, Churyurov Gerasimenko. It was the target of the Rosetta mission. This is the smallest body we've orbited with a spacecraft, by the way. Um, and it's a comet, an example of a short period comet. And it's one of several that we have sent missions to. Now, this comet looks almost nothing like any of the other comets that we've been to. It's a unique world. And most of the theories that we had before we got there about how the environment would be, they turned out to be wrong. We have found gas compounds that we didn't believe could be present. Uh, the surface turned out to be a lot tougher than we thought it would be. Um, we don't really understand a lot of the features on the surface or how they're formed. And a lot of open questions have been raised about exactly how comets are assembled in the first place. So our visit to this comet and the other few comets that we've looked at have ended up being a case of raising more questions than you answer, which is really not what you want to do when you're trying to look at these objects as the new world. You want to find uh, common characteristics, things that will tell you what to do. But if you can't, then that means that every place you want to go, you need to visit beforehand. And that's something that we can't do with our current model. In terms of the exploration of the Americas, where we are right now is kind of like the Jamestown era. We know a lot about a few places that we spent a lot of money and effort to get to, 
And we know where North America is generally, and we kind of know how big it is, but we don't know where the rivers are, we don't know where the mountains are, we don't know where you can grow food, we don't know where it rains, where it doesn't, where the tornadoes happen, where the bears are. We don't know the details, and based on this map, we don't even know where the Pacific Northwest is. So, if we're going to explore NEOs the same way that we explore um, North America, we need to go at it the same way. What made it possible for us to go from the Jamestown era to the modern era was a combination of motivation and technology. And that's where we are right now. So I've already explained that we have scientific motivation, that's my thing, but we also have economic motivation in two areas. First is launch. So it costs between 5,000 and 10,000 euros to take one kilogram of material from the surface of Earth and put it in space. That's an enormous incentive to build things in space as opposed to launching them in space. That's a lot of money. If we have material there to do it, it's worth exploiting that. And we do. And that's the second part of this motivation. There is tremendous wealth in near-Earth objects and asteroids in general. They are loaded with metals like gold, platinum, iron, rare earths, water, other organic materials, phosphorus. We know of one asteroid, Psyche, that may contain enough iron to meet our current needs for steel for more than a million years. There are now economists doing forecasts that suggest that the total value of mining this population of uh, material could be the equivalent of 100 billion euros per person on Earth. An enormous amount of wealth. So we have massive economic and scientific reasons for doing this. The technology needs to come along, and the good news is it has. Over the last uh, two decades or so, there has been an explosion of microsatellite technology, CubeSats, SmallSats. These are smaller, more compact, easier to fly, less expensive missions that can go do things that we wouldn't risk a billion dollar spacecraft to do. And as these become more capable, we become more able to do what I call a high throughput investigation, which means that we can look at a lot of these objects to assess their scientific and economic value to us. And I'm not alone in thinking about this. Uh, there are whole corporations that have been formed around the idea of utilizing resources in space. Companies like Planetary Resources and Deep Space Initiatives. In Europe, the government of Luxembourg has made a several hundred million euro bet that they can become the nation of space mining. And there are educational institutions, like my home institution of the University of Arizona, where we are developing educational programs to address the ethical, technical, and scientific issues that are going to be coming when we begin to exploit these resources for our own use. Now, to me, the key to getting there is that bottom part of the, of the uh, Venn diagram I showed you, which is high throughput investigation with small satellites. And in my group at the University of Arizona, we have been working to develop a concept for this that we call Wayfarer, and a Wayfarer is a very small spacecraft, maybe uh, about this big by this big. It weighs maybe 20 to 25 kilograms. It has one or two scientific instruments that are tailored for looking at small bodies and learning the maximum amount from them. We can build these using a common format. That common format allows assembly line construction. Assembly line construction brings down its cost even more, and so an individual one of these spacecraft could cost less than 1% of one of these bigger spacecraft that we sent to one object. In addition to the cost of the spacecraft as well, the mission design is flexible. Instead of launching one time with one rocket to send in one object to one place, we shove these into the nooks and crannies of every launch vehicle that goes up, commercial, scientific, military, you name it, we put it in there, and once these objects get into orbit, these wayfarers, they go and 
transition themselves to an orbital parking lot beyond the moon where they sit and wait for us to tell them where to explore. And when we do that, they can do all kinds of things. We can send them to an asteroid or a comet and have it go into orbit like the Rosetta spacecraft did. We can study it in great detail. Or if we just want to see a lot of objects, we can fly one or two of them by a number of small bodies just to get a sense of what's going on. We can also um, have multiple spacecraft work together in an environment about a body. And we can send them out on a mission from place to place, orbiting one, orbiting another, orbiting another, and then coming back to the orbital parking lot. All of those are options for us. And we can even play exotic games where we put one in orbit around an object and then we put another object in a position to hit an asteroid to look at what's inside. We can do this because these objects are cheap, easily replicated, but capable enough to deliver the science we want. Now, we are one of only, or one of several, I should say, uh, organizations that are looking at this kind of technology. There are corporations, governments, and businesses, or in universities that are also trying to build their own version of Wayfair. And they have different emphasis. I don't know which of these is going to be the one that succeeds. I hope it's us. But I do know that somebody is going to get this right. And we are going to go out and have an explosive exploration of near-Earth space, we're going to find these resources. And once we do, we open up the opportunity to colonize our new world. This is a long game. It won't be us, but our grandchildren, or their grandchildren, may live in buildings built with steel from asteroids. They may eat food grown in soil that was either composed of or fortified by material we brought back from asteroids and comets. They may drink water that was mined from a comet that's also being used as fuel on the spacecraft on which they live, work, and travel. And they'll have all that wealth that we were talking about. That is our shore in the Bahamas. We're standing there today. It's a new world. Thank you.